What's going on, Data Devotees? My name is Jameson Crawford, and this video is kind of an introduction to R, discussing about how R is essentially an over-designed calculator. We talk a little bit about how to create objects using what's called assignment in R and the assignment operator. And lastly, we get into some details about uh, how to name objects and some of the things that you can do with objects, which you can create through assignments. So without further ado, let's get rolling. So I'm currently in R Studio. As you might find it if you were to start a new session, it's a relatively clean slate. And I'm going to go ahead and simply clear with Control L the console. And what's more, I'm going to hold down Control Shift and N to open up a new script. Now I'm going to save the script real quick just, uh, just to be able to... Uh, save time with that. And what's more, uh, let's talk about R as a calculator. So uh, what does that mean? Well, essentially, you can perform any matter of any manner of arithmetic operations in R. And those include things like plus, like minus, I'll put these in annotations, plus minus, so we have addition and subtraction, We've got multiplication, which you perform with an asterisk. We've got division, which you use a forward slash to perform. We have exponentiation, which you use, uh, in other words, exponents, which you use this sort of caret. And we also have parentheses. And so all of these you may have seen before in more complex examples uh, of arithmetic statements or, or operations. And so let's take a look at an example of that right now. So a simple arithmetic operation would be the addition of 2 plus 2 or the sum of 2 plus 2. Now this in itself becomes an arithmetic or a mathematical expression. And if we press control and return, we see that that's executed in our console and the output is printed out below the expression and that is, of course, 4. And so just as you might suspect, 4 minus 2, if we run that expression, it gets run interactively in the console, and we get uh, the printed result being 2, and that is virtually with every other one of these arithmetic operators. So let's try 4 times 2, and of course we get 8, we can do 4 to the second power, in other words, uh, 4 times 4, and that of course is 16. And we can also use parentheses, but we'll get there in a second. Um, and so essentially you can perform relatively complex uh, arithmetic operations here. So if we were to say take uh, 4 to the second power divided by 2, plus 2. Anyone know what this result might be? So let's break that down. That's going to be 4 to the second power is 16 divided by 2 is 8 plus 2 is 10. Let's see if that works. And of course we get 10. What happens if we switch that around though? And let's do the addition portion of this first. What's going to happen? we also get 10. Why? Shouldn't it be uh, 2 plus 4 equals 6 to the second power? So 6 times 6 is 36 divided by 2 would be 18. Uh, unfortunately, no, that's not what happens. Well, I suppose fortunately as well, because of course, this follows the order of operations, aka PEMDAS, or you may have heard Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So it's important to keep in mind that while this can uh, perform arithmetic operations, it is also following the order of operations. Uh, and that's extremely important, especially when you're working with uh, transformation of values and so on and so forth. And this is really where parentheses come in. So if I were to take, uh, remember the P in parentheses uh, is the first arithmetic operator that, that gets performed or executed, so to speak. So if we were to wrap 2 plus 4, which is actually evaluated last because addition and subtraction are last in the PEMDAS order, 
we can actually make that first by using parentheses and it will follow the order of operations. Remember we had said that 2 plus 4 becomes 6 and then to the second power would be 6 times 6 equals 36 and the entire expression itself becomes 18 because after uh, 6 times 6 becomes 36 we divide that by 2 and it becomes 18. So again we're following that order of operations. So next is something called assignment. And we use assignment in order to create objects. Now, what is an object in R? An object in R could ultimately be anything that you store information in. R is what's called a, uh, an OOP language. In other words, uh, an object-oriented programming language. And the majority of your work that you'll be doing in R as you go forward and learning the language will revolve around using objects. So how do we create an object? Well, we can actually simply take an object that we've not initialized yet. We'll call this object X, and we use what's called the assignment operator. That's just the less than sign followed by a dash. Now R is telling us it's an unexpected end of document because it's expecting us to use assignment to store some sort of information inside object X. So in this case, I'm just going to simply store the value 3. If I press Control and Return, we run that expression. Now we don't see the contents of object X, but one change that we have noticed is that X now appears in our global environment, and we can see that it contains the value 3, and it's actually sorted under this tab called Values. What about if we had, say, uh, multiple values? So let's say we wanted to store in Y uh, using what's called the combine function or function C. We can combine multiple values and store them uh, inside an object using this function, and we separate them with commas. So 5, 10, and 15, control and return, and so we have now created this object y, which contains values with a length of three. In other words, uh, there are three elements inside it. We can also see its class is numeric, so these are numeric values, as opposed to text values, aka character, um, or logical values uh, comprised of true and false, that sort of thing. And so we can actually see this preview of some of these values. Obviously, um, you can store hundreds, thousands, even millions of values in an object, but we can see all of the values in here because we only have an object of length three or of three different elements. So what about tabular data? Like, uh, for example, if we look at the iris data set. Now, this is a popular data set that contains 150 different species of irises, uh, excuse me, three different species of viruses and 150 different observations. And so this is already built into R. We'll be using a lot of built-in data sets going forward. But uh, if we wanted to assign all of these columns, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species, if we wanted to assign those and the 150 observations um, under those columns, we can do so with assignment. And there we have Z. And now we can see that in our global environment in the upper right, that Z is labeled differently. It's now under data as opposed to values where X represents, uh, the object X represents or contains value three and the object Y represents or contains five, 10 or 15. Now Z is under data because it represents 150 observations and five different variables. Again. 150 rows and five different columns ranging across the top here. So that's assignment. And one more thing to note with assignment, and this isn't always necessary, but it could be helpful, is that if you wrap an assignment operation inside parentheses, it not only, and let's actually run this again. Notice how we don't see the product of X or we don't see the product of Y when we assign these three values to y, what if we did want to see 
that the actual product of y or what's contained inside y. Well, if we put that in parentheses, that's precisely what happens. Uh, so not only do we assign to y, and we can even assign it to an entirely new object's name, we'll call this a, and we'll see it appear in the top right. And so we can see a, object a is created with the same numeric values, and we can also see that object and its contents printed out at the bottom of this expression. Lastly, there's something called auto printing. So of course, any object that you have, you simply, you can highlight it or simply be at the end of the line or the expression, hold down control and return, or there's always this run command if you'd like to click your way to victory, and that will automatically print the contents of that object in the console, which is quite useful. Lastly, we can also even assign functions. So we've seen functions like read or uh, write.csv before. And this is an example of we can write uh, uh, the data set iris and we can name it iris.csv. And that's going to name, that's going to create a CSV file containing the 150 observations in iris. And that's going to be stored in our local uh, working directory, which you can find with the function git wd. Now let's say, let's go ahead and set our working directory to something different. Let's do downloads. And now that we've set our working directory to be downloads, we can see with the function dir or directory uh, that we can see the contents inside that directory. And so let's go ahead and write this again and we'll call this uh, my iris. And now we can see if we run directory that my iris will have appeared inside. We have iris CSV already, there's my iris a new addition to our list of elements that are inside our directory, our working directory. And that's because we just used write CSV. But what if we saved write CSV as a new object? So we'll simply do write CSV without any parentheses parentheses. And so uh, in other words, the bare function name without any additional arguments like X or like the name of the file or the path. And we're going to take write CSV and assign it to write new this object here. And so when I press control and return here, now we have this third class of different objects. Well, before we had data and values, we now have functions and we have function write new. So I can use write new in the exact same way as we used write CSV. In this case, we'll choose uh, data set iris. So x equals iris, and then we'll name it my iris new function. And I'm gonna give it a long name just because uh, it'll be easier to spot. So run it, it does its thing, it happens in the console. And then let's see if this function which actually stores another function, this object, which stores a function. Let's see if that actually worked. And sure enough, here we go. My iris new function dot CSV. So in other words, this really uh, goes to show you that you can use assignment for creating new functions, modifying or renaming new functions. And it's also uh, a great demonstration of the fact that whether it's a single scalar value or a vector of values or a data frame, or in other words, tabular data containing, containing uh, information, or if it's a function, all of these different things are objects and they're all assigned through assignment. So last, let's talk about object details. Now there are a few things to note about objects. It, simply, simply put, um, well, firstly, 
we know that x contains 3 or represents 3. So you can use that algebraically. Now, algebra comes from the Arabic, which means uh, to make whole. And in other words, if we were to add 2 plus x, we can make this whole because there is, in, in effect, this missing piece. x uh, contains the value 3, and in order to make that expression whole, we simply evaluate it, and the output is 5. So it's very similar in this sense to algebra. Now, if we were to assign new values to x, let's say 10, I'll go ahead and run that. Now, 2 plus x equals 12. And so that kind of creates this sort of dynamic relationship between the values that objects can contain or represent, and it allows it to be flexible so that when you change your data or you change your values, then the formulas that you create or the expressions that you use uh, in which you use those objects, those are going to adjust or adapt to whatever new data or new values that you use. And so that's, that's a very important concept to understand when you're really starting out in R. And it'll become increasingly important as we learn more. So other things. Well, we can't uh, exactly call everything an object. And so if we wanted to call this 10x, it's not going to let us do that unexpected symbol in 10x. So they can't start with certain symbols uh, and they or certain characters. And that's just an example of that. So it has to start in this case with on uh, some sort of a letter or uh, alphabetical character. And then we can put numbers after it if we want. And this is particularly useful if, for example, you're doing some sort of date afterwards. So if we did x2020, that works. But if we did Twenty twenty x that does not work. So one thing to keep in mind. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is the different conventions that you can use when you're naming objects. So you'll see a variety of them used uh, throughout your experience with R, whether it's looking at different people's blogs, whether it's reading documentation and looking at examples, or whether it's reading this uh, the the textbooks that that you may be using in your course right now for. Uh, are. And so these different conventions are worth pointing out now. And they also point to kind of what are some of the more common characters that you can use in your uh, object names. So for example, if we were to name this my value, and we'd simply have three, I'm going to go ahead and clear these objects. And we'll push this down a little bit as well. So again, we're talking about different uh, conventions. This is called camel caps. And camel caps are essentially uh, starting a, uh, well, essentially you have more than one word combined, but you separate them. Instead of using spaces, you separate them by capitalizing the first character in each of those words. If we had a space, this expression isn't going to ev evaluate. Unexpected symbol in my value, yes. Well, the unexpected symbol happens to be likely that space because it's an invalid statement. And so camel caps works to be able to create an object name that has no spaces whatsoever. And so that's something certainly to keep in mind. Um, there are lower camel caps. And so we can do those right now. And that's typically when you have the first word in that combination of words uh, essentially has not been capitalized. So that's lower ca camel caps, also known as camel case. But anyways, it's uh, not too important to get kind of bogged down in the names of these naming conventions. Uh, you can also separate uh, words or multiple word object names with, uh, rather than capitalization, you can use for example, periods. And this, this is a naming convention that you often see in R. It's, it's very common in R, in fact, much more so in R, that is separating uh, words by a period, much more common in R 
than in most other programming languages. Uh, and one great example of that we've already seen was write.csv. And those use this period to be able to separate the word, or the in this case, the initialism, CSV, and the word write. So what else? Well, um, oh, and just, just for fun, this has been called a uh, leopard case by some. And uh, yeah, so that <laughs> that's an interesting convention in R uh, called leopard case, leopard case. And I think that comes probably from the fact that we have camel case. So let's use another animal. And what you'll also see oftentimes is instead of my value uh, with a period, we can separate it with an underscore. We'll call that my value. And I have read and heard, again, these are all kind of just a single numeric value stored with different uh, objects and with their object names using different naming conventions. One thing that's important is to be consistent when you name your objects or when you do your code or anything like that, whatever conventions you're using, uh, just to be consistent. So anyways, back to the fun, um, not Sanke, snake, not Sanke, snake. Snake case is another name that you might see for this uh, this particular convention when it comes to separating words. Now, what's interesting is that you will see uh, most commonly core R packages will use this uh, convention of this uh, leopard case or this period to separate words, whereas oftentimes... Um, excuse me, not core R packages, but core R itself, those are the... the functions that come out of the box with the vanilla R, so to speak. However, typically newer packages, and in particular packages that come from RStudio themselves, will use an underscore, and it's kind of a calling card that distinguishes uh, these so-called tidyverse or RStudio packages, oftentimes either made or uh, co-authored by Hadley Wickham and other R thought leaders, and they tend to use underscores. So it's just an interesting way to be able to recognize whether a function uses base R, that is the original R that's getting updated by the Comprehensive R Archive Network and our uh, core R team and uh, the R Foundation, all that stuff, uh, versus uh, RStudio, where you have um, this kind of calling card here and this uh, company that's not only updating awesome packages, like think better ways to use our markdown and shiny, but also creating and updating this uh, user interface for us to be able to use R with. Um, so one example of that would be with library, uh, excuse me, with the read R package or read R library. So if we did read.csv, there's that, but read R has a read underscore CSV. And you can even see those differences when you go into import data when you choose from text with base or core R, you're going to get read.csv, aka leopard case. And if you use uh, from text with the read R package, you're going to get read underscore CSV, aka uh, snake case. So anyways, those names aren't necessarily universal, but they are certainly fun and uh, a nice little compliment to uh, naming conventions uh, for to keep to keep camel uh, our camel caps, uh, you know, in a, in a nice, uh, well accompanied environment with other lovely animals. So anyways, this is a introduction, uh, again, to, uh, essentially R as a calculator. We talked about arithmetic, uh, operations in R and how R follows the order of operations or PEMDAS. We talked about the assignment operator and how to create objects that can contain different values either single values, multiple values, or even tabular data. We also talked about how to even store functions like write.csv as uh, inside a new object and how those will appear in the uh, global environment and recognized and usable as a function as well. We also talked about some different um, invalid characters when it comes to naming objects and things that you can and cannot do, how you can use objects as a sort of uh, algebraic operation, 
In other words, objects can represent um, different values, and then you can use them in an arithmetic operation, just like in algebra. And lastly, we talked about a few different conventions that you can use when it comes to uh, naming your objects when you're using assignment. So that's it. Hope this was helpful. And uh, y'all have a good one when it comes to creating new objects in your object-oriented programming in R.